In this video, we solve problem 8.3.15-T from Essentials of Statistics, 6th edition by Mario Triola. The problem statement says, in a test of the effectiveness of garlic for lowering cholesterol, 36 subjects were treated with raw garlic. Cholesterol levels were measured before and after treatment. The changes before minus after and their levels of LDL cholesterol in milligrams per deciliter have a mean of 0.4 and a standard deviation of 22.2. We're asked to use a 0.01 significance level to test the claim that with garlic treatment, the mean change in LDL cholesterol is greater than zero. And then the question says, what do the results suggest about the effectiveness of the garlic treatment? Assume that a simple random sample has been selected. Identify the null and alternative hypotheses the test statistic, the p-value, and then state a final conclusion that addresses the original claim. Okay, in order to do this, I'm going to share my paper with you. Okay, so the first thing that we do is we look at the problem statement and we look for the original claim if we're trying to identify the null and alternative hypotheses. So let's see, I'm looking for the claim, there it is. Um, we're testing the claim that with garlic treatment, the mean change in LDL cholesterol is greater than zero. So the claim is that the mean of the change is greater than zero. Now, if that's not true, if it's not greater than zero, it would have to be less than or equal to zero. Now, if I'm trying to decide what the null and alternative hypotheses are. First I state the claim, then I state what would be true if the claim is not true. And then I look at the two of these and I say, which one does not contain the condition of equality? In this case, it happens to be the original claim. So that is the alternative hypothesis. And then the null hypothesis is not this one, but it's a, but it's a hypothesis that looks identical to the one in the alternative hypothesis, but instead of that greater than sign, it has an equal sign. So our null is that the mean is equal to zero. Our alternative hypothesis is that the mean is greater than zero. So this is what we're looking for in my lab statistics. Let's see if they have it over there. Okay, so I need a mean of zero and a, um, or excuse me, a, a null hypothesis where the mean is zero and an alternative hypothesis where the mean is greater than zero. Okay, so that's option B. And the units are, uh, looks like milligrams per deciliter. Okay. And then we want to determine the test statistic. And it asks us to round to two decimal places as needed. I'll show you my paper for this as well. So in order to do this, I need to decide whether I am testing a claim about a mean where the standard deviation of the population is known or where it's not known. So I go through the problem statement and I'm looking for a standard deviation. Okay, it looks like I've got a sample mean of 0 0.4 and a sample standard deviation. And no other standard deviation is listed. Since the uh, population standard deviation is unknown, we're going to use a t-test. This just means that our sample distribution of sample means is going to be analyzed using a student t distribution as opposed to analyzing a standard normal distribution. So here's the idea. Whenever we're testing a hypothesis, we're always thinking about the sampling distribution of the sample statistic that we're looking at. So since we're testing means here, we're interested in the sampling distribution of the sample means x bar provided we have a whole bunch of samples that all have the same size. We compute the sample means for each of those samples and then we look at the distribution and under certain conditions it looks something like this. Now, back in lesson 6.3, we learned that the mean of the sample means is equal to the true population mean. And this sampling distribution that we're drawing here 
is the sampling distribution that we would have provided that the null hypothesis is true. So in this case, we're assuming that that mean of the sample means, which is the true population mean, is equal to zero. And then the question becomes, if this is our sampling distribution of X bar with this mean, is the value of X bar that was obtained in our sample um, significantly high or significantly low? So we need to graph X bar on this graph. And if I go back up to my problem statement, I see that my sample had a mean of 0 0.4. So X bar is right here, let's say, and that's 0 0.4 milligrams per deciliter. And that is the change in before minus after, um, looking at the um, measurement of LDL cholesterol before and subtracting the uh, measurement of LDL cholesterol after. That change is equal to 0 0.4 milligrams per deciliter. And now our question becomes, is that significantly high? If it is significantly high, then we're going to say, huh, the assumption that told us that that was improbable is probably wrong. So let's throw out the assumption, which is throwing out the null hypothesis. And that means we're rejecting the null, in other words. And if we're rejecting the null, that will allow us to say something about the original claim. So we need to decide whether this X bar is significantly high given this assumption. In order to do that, we convert from this distribution to the student T distribution, which looks very similar to a normal distribution, but it just has a different uh, variation. The mean of the student T distribution is zero, but the standard deviation is generally greater than one. Um, so the question becomes, well, how is this X bar related to the corresponding t-score over here. That's why we call this a t-test. Well, in order to find the t-value, that's our test statistic, we use this formula. The t-value is x-bar minus the mean of that sampling distribution of x-bar divided by um, the sample standard deviation associated with x-bar. So we'll have x-bar minus this guy, and this guy is equal to that assumed mean in the null hypothesis. And then this down here is the sample standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. So if we enter all of that, just substitute in all of the values that we are aware of, X bar was 0 0.4. The mean that we're testing against is that the mean is equal to zero. And the standard deviation of our sample was 22.2. And our sample size was, is it not listed? In a test of the effectiveness of garlic for lowering cholesterol, 36 subjects. All right, so N is equal to 36. Goes right there. So we just have to evaluate this expression. If you want, of course, you could just take the square root and get six there. So you're gonna have 0.4 divided by, open parentheses, 22.2 divided by the square root of 36, which is six, close parentheses. And we get 30, or four over 37, which is approximately equal to zero point, well, it's actually exactly equal to 0 0.18, or 0 0.108 repeating. Okay, so the t-score that goes with this x-bar is just slightly more than t equals zero. That's our test statistic t. We call it t sub test if we wanted to. And that is approximately equal to 0 0.108. Okay, let's see if my lab statistics likes this answer. Okay, they ask us to round to two decimal places. So that's approximately 0 0.11 if I round to two decimal places, great. And then it wants us to determine the p-value. Now we can't determine p-values with a table here because we're talking about the student t distribution, but we can use technology. I will show you how to use Excel, but you can use a TI-83 or a TI-84 plus 
either one of those is fine. You can use um, Minitab or StatDisk or any of the other um, software packages that are available, but I'll show you how to use Excel because most people have access to Excel. Um, so we're going to determine the p-value, but first I want to talk through what it means on this piece of paper. So we'll do that. Okay, now, finding the p-value um, always requires that we determine whether the test is one-tailed or two-tailed. So we go back to our alternative hypothesis and we see that the alternative is that the mean is greater than zero. We can think of this as an arrow pointing to the right. So that alternative hypothesis implies that we have a right-tailed test. In that case, we're interested in the area to the right of this test statistic or at this sample statistic, which is the same as the area to the right of this test statistic over here. I didn't do a very good job drawing them exactly the same, but um, you get the idea. That area is supposed to be equal to that area. And both of those are equal to the p-value for this right-tailed test. So p is equal to the probability that x bar is greater than 0.4 which is equal to the probability that our test statistic T is greater than approximately 0.11. And both of these are approximations. Well, actually, I think that first one is an equal sign, sorry. And then this can be found using technology. Um, since it's a right-tailed test, I'm going to use Excel. And the function in Excel is called T dot dist and then if i just leave it like this it's going to give me the area to the left but i want the area to the right so we use this function t dot dist dot rt for right and then you'll, you'll open parentheses and you're going to type in the value of the test statistic which is 0 0.11 and then you have to enter the desired degrees of freedom so the test statistic goes here, and the degrees of freedom that go with it go with that particular distribution go over there. Because remember, all the student t distributions are different depending on the sample size. We can think of it as a single distribution, but they all have slightly different variation depending on the sample size. So we've got this student t distribution over here, but we're talking about a specific one of those this is the specific student t distribution associated with degrees of freedom equal to n minus one, where n is our sample size. Well, there were 36 subjects in our sample, right? So the degrees of freedom must be 35. So the degrees of freedom go right there. That's 35. I'm just going to enter this into Excel and see what it tells me. Okay, so we go to equals t dot dist dot rt for right, open parentheses, and then it reminds you what you're supposed to do. We enter that t score of 0 0.108. I think I'll use that value. It's a little bit more accurate. And then the degrees of freedom are um, 35. So we get about um, 0 0.4. Five seven three when I don't round or when I, when I round to three decimal places instead of two decimal places. So let's see if my lab statistics likes that version of the answer. If they don't like it, I will round to two decimal places and use that test statistic T instead. Okay, so it says determine the p-value and round to three decimal places. Um, my p was 0 0.4573. Rounded to three decimal places, that's approximately 0 0.457. Okay, it likes it, great. And now we want to state the final conclusion that it addresses the original claim. So remember what this P is, it's a probability. So this is a probability of getting a test statistic equal to our test statistic or more than that, which is equivalent to the probability of getting an X bar, a sample mean, equal to 0 0.4 or more than that. And we're saying, well, that the probability of getting that X bar is 0 0.457, which is approximately 45%, 45.7%. So we're saying that's actually very likely. Some, something that has a probability of 45.7% happening 
um, is very likely. So that means that this, this X bar could have easily occurred due to chance. And so we, there is no reason that we should reject the null hypothesis. We can't accept the null hypothesis, but we can fail to reject the null hypothesis. Now, in general, we should be comparing this p-value to alpha. In our case, alpha is the significance level in the problem statement. It's 0 0.01. And obviously, with a, a p of 0 0.4573, which is approximately 45%, we have a 45.7% chance of this happening. Um, and that's definitely greater than a 1% chance. So um, we've got p is greater than alpha, which implies that we do not have enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis. So we fail to reject the null. Okay, so it says fail to reject the null. And now we need to think about what the original claim stated. The claim was this, that the um, population mean is greater than zero. And we're failing to reject the null. So we're saying there is a chance that the mean is actually equal to zero. Hmm. So it looks like we do not have enough evidence to support our claim. So we'll say there is not sufficient evidence to conclude that the mean of the population changes um, is greater than zero. And that's it.